I'm Dr. Chip Levy. I'm a professor of medicine at the John Oshner Heart and Vascular Institute, Oshner Clinical School, the University of Queensland School of Medicine here in New Orleans, Louisiana. And I'm here to discuss our study entitled A Prospective Study of Fasting Plasma Glucose and Risk of Stroke in Asymptomatic Men. I'd first like to acknowledge and congratulate the excellent efforts of our first and main author of the paper, Dr. Shimei Su of the Department of Exercise Sciences, Arnold School of Public Health, University of South Carolina in Columbia, as well as my other co-authors, especially the senior author, also from the University of South Carolina, Dr. Steve Blair, who's well-recognized and internationally known for his contributions to the areas of exercise and fitness, and he collected these data previously at, from the Aerobic Center Longitudinal Study during his years working at the Cooper Clinic in Dallas, Texas. Clearly, diabetes mellitus is increasing at an alarming and epidemic proportions in the United States and worldwide. And this is probably due to the epidemics of overweightness and obesity, as well as the very large amount of physical inactivity in our societies. Diabetes certainly contributes substantially to the morbidity and mortality from both cardiovascular and cerebrovascular diseases. Prior studies have indicated that diabetes is an independent and direct contributor to the risk of stroke. Several years ago in 2003, the American Diabetes Association lowered the limits for impaired fasting glucose from 110 milligram per deciliter down to 100 milligram per deciliter. And this lower cutoff has been criticized somewhat in the literature, including concerns expressed regarding public health implications. Well, in our study, we assessed the impact of elevated fasting glucose levels, including impaired fasting glucose at this lower limit of 100 to 109 milligram per deciliter, as well as higher limits, 110 and over, in addition to 126 and higher values which are consistent with diabetes and evaluated this for the risk of stroke, total strokes, non-fatal and fatal strokes and we adjusted our data for cardiorespiratory fitness. We assessed this data in a very large cohort from the Aerobic Center Longitudinal Study of nearly 44,000 men who were previously healthy and asymptomatic and these men uh, were followed for a very long time for over 700,000 man years to determine the risk of stroke. Their average age was 44 years, but their age varied widely from 20 to 87 years. In our study, we found that fasting plasma glucose was an independent risk factor for stroke. Starting at a level of about 110 milligram per deciliter, for every 10 unit increase in fasting glucose, there was a 6% independent risk of total strokes with increased risk of non-fatal and fatal strokes by 8% and 4% respectively. Interestingly, our data did not find an increased risk of stroke at the lower level of impaired fasting glucose between 100 and 109 milligrams per deciliter. We believe that our results are quite significant clinically. Obviously, millions of patients each day in the United States are tested for fasting glucose, and many of them are found to have impaired fasting glucose or newly diagnosed diabetes. And certainly, a large number of these patients are at increased risk of cardiovascular diseases, including the risk of stroke. In our data, we found at least that the lower levels of impaired fasting glucose, between 100 and 109 milligram per deciliter, were not associated with increased risk of stroke, which challenges the use of this lower cutoff, at least with regard to the important cardiovascular diagnosis of stroke. But at higher levels of impaired fasting glucose, starting at 110 milligram per deciliter, stroke was significantly and independently increased, including total, fatal, and non-fatal strokes. And strokes is certainly a devastating complication associated with considerable morbidity disability as well as mortality, so efforts to reduce glucose levels and reduce the risk of stroke seem to be merited. We believe that our data are also quite significant for patients, and, and obviously, particularly for the patients who have elevated glucose values, and this number is increasing because of the epidemic in obesity and physical inactivity, and certainly patients would like to 
prevent strokes because strokes can be devastating, especially they want to prevent the disabling and the fatal strokes. So efforts to reduce glucose levels with dietary means, lowering glycemic indices in the diet, but most importantly, increasing uh, physical activity in our society and preventing and reducing overweightness and obesity. These efforts are desperately needed. It would be nice for others to confirm our results, especially using populations that are different in ethnic and racial backgrounds from the group that we studied. It would also be nice if people could demonstrate with various interventions, interventions designed to reduce fasting glucose levels, if these interventions can not only prevent diabetes, but more importantly, can they prevent the devastating cardiovascular and cerebrovascular complications of this disease. In conclusion, our results from a very large cohort from the aerobic center longitudinal study of previously asymptomatic and healthy men shows that increased levels of fasting glucose are an independent risk factor for stroke. Even at levels below the threshold of diabetes, starting at levels of about 110 milligram per deciliter, there's an independent increased risk in stroke, and that includes fatal, non-fatal, and total strokes. And considering the considerable morbidity and mortality that's associated with stroke, efforts at reducing glucose and hopefully preventing stroke seem to be merited. Thank you. We hope you benefited from this presentation based on the content of Mayo Clinic proceedings. Our journal's mission is to promote the best interests of patients by advancing the knowledge and professionalism of the physician community. If you're interested in more information about Mayo Clinic Proceedings, visit our website at www.mayoclinicproceedings.org. There you will find additional videos on our YouTube channel, and you can follow us on Twitter. For more information on healthcare at Mayo Clinic, please visit www.mayoclinic.org. This video content is copyrighted by Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research.